Hello team and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself John from MSP so Ukraine War update extra video giving you extra nuggets and tidbits to get your teeth into to give you a greater understanding of the war in Ukraine and we're going to go to Dell's Excel spreadsheet of the general staff figures for the Russian losses throughout the the course of this war. Now the caveats obviously apply to this these are general staff figures this is one side of the story uh, there will be elements of propaganda inaccuracy all sorts concerning these figures but i've been at pains to show you over the course of my reporting that i think these are broadly correct at least in terms of trend lines and it's kind of the trend lines that we're going to look at today in this video i've done this maybe three times before so i have to say a massive thank you for del for putting these together in his own time uh, they are the link to this there's a OneDrive link an open source link that is available for all of you to click on it in every single description to my videos uh, apart from maybe the live ones when i do live streams but that link is there so please go and check this out on a daily basis if you want to uh, he has those figures and anal uh, well doesn't analyze them he pre presents them and i'll do the analysis i am just it's going to be stream of consciousness as all of my videos are so i don't know what we're going to find but i'm sure i'll have something to say about them uh, so, so the raw data is on this first part of the uh, the worksheet what i'm going to do however is i am going to move myself no i'm not going to do that that was that was clearly ridiculous i'm going to move myself to the top of the screen so i don't get in the way of the data the grass which i have done in the past so we'll go to personnel now so this is what the personnel losses look like uh, over the course of the war when you get these uh this blue line showing the total well you have that on all the graphs this is the total and the steeper the line the more the losses so as you can see these daily uh, totals here of personnel losses uh, spike and that means that the blue line gets steeper the blue line will never go down because you're always going to add to what you've previously had so it's not like this yellow dotted line that shows a kind of trend line an averaged out trend line that can go down as the totals go as, as the each daily the total goes might go lower than previously so the trend lines can go down but the but the blue line will always go up the question is what is the gradient so the steeper the worse it is so so you can see two things you can see it gets steeper here flattens out a little bit and then gets steeper in in this in this point here so we look here at the first area of heavy losses and that's october november december in 2022 and that was at the time of the kharkiv lightning counter offensive and uh, the kherson counter offensive where the russians lost uh, a large amount of ground but also a large amount of equipment and personnel that's what we ex would expect to see and we we see these these losses be representing those activities then then in April, May, June, July, August, the Russian losses were not huge. There's a little bit of a spike here in June as the Ukrainian counteroffensive kicked into gear. Um, but generally, it was not a case of the Russians losing huge amounts of equipment. In fact, what's interesting is that Russians lose more equipment and personnel when they attack, it appears now. So apart from the, the huge success of the the unpredicted Kharkiv lightning counteroffensive and what took place in Kherson we we now we now have this situation where the Russians are throwing themselves at quite entrenched Ukrainian defensive lines where the Ukrainians have a lot of drone a lot more drone capacity than they did previously and so therefore the Russians lose a lot of equipment in attacking and so this leads me to then claim as I did yesterday that the Ukrainians have good reason to sit on the defensive for the next four or five months if they can continue to trip the Russians at this rate. So defense is good for the Ukrainians. It's not about taking land at the moment. It's about causing the Russians to take to make huge losses in terms of personnel and equipment. So you can see personnel it, losses here are, are much worse in October, November, December. Now, apparently December had the highest month of losses or... Yes, I think it was the highest in uh, maybe because there's one more day in December. So you've got, got another 1,000 on. But as, as you can see, either way, 
you know, you got heavy losses in all three of these months with a couple of really high spikes moving up to 1,380 back in November, October, sorry, and then 1,330 in November. So there's some really heavy days, uh, these, these punctuations there where there could have been just huge attacks by the Russians or, and maybe at the same time, some troop accumulations hit by the Ukrainians. So that, that's, that's the personnel list here we have a tank loss uh and you can see the the, the vast amount loss right at the beginning that was when you had those huge columns that were hit by by Raktar drones and other munitions at the beginning of the war uh, and then we had a re again around september and october the kharkiv lightning counter offensive where they lost huge amounts of equipment that was just left abandoned the russian the ukrainians took uh captured a bunch of equipment so on and so forth so you've got these these areas where uh the russians have, have lost more and then it gets into october november december and again what's interesting to note here is that these moments are not when the ukrainians were attacking so interestingly when the ukrainians were attacking in may june july august we actually had fewer vehicles being lost fewer tanks being lost and the tanks appear to be used by the russians in their offensive operations and and that can be said at the beginning of the war as well uh but they did lose a lot in in because what happened in kharkiv if you remember is that the ukrainians broke through the lines and did this kind of almost like thunder run type thing where they were just they smashed the lines and took loads of land really really quickly and almost came in behind the russians and the russians kind of panicked they abandoned loads of equipment and so there would have been lots of tanks abandoned at that point lots of apvs and other vehicles abandoned so that's that's really what happened there then later on you're moving towards the the Kherson that was more grinding and actually not so much equipment was lost in the Kherson uh, counter-offensive because the Russians were able to operationally withdraw and get much of their equipment back across the Kherson uh, across the Dnipro River much to the consternation of, of pro-Ukrainians but you can see it's been fairly consistent in terms of the gradient of the blue line for tank losses until you get to again the end of the Ukrainian counter-offensive so that's sort of October time period uh, beginning of October was when the Russians decided to attack at Adivka and they just lost you remember those columns and columns of vehicles that were, were lost well, that's going to include tanks and uh, during that time period they lost 55 tanks in one day one day 55 tanks as according to general staff but take a third off that if you want to be over conservative and that's still going to be a stupid amount of tanks. That's sort of 40 tanks in one day. My goodness, if the British lost that, that's uh, that's pretty much most of our t tank, uh, most of our tanks, really, uh, as far as working uh, tanks and whatnot. So, you know, th these are huge losses for the Russians. And you can see punctuated in uh, several points. And again, going up uh, on average recently, you know, to, to fairly high levels. As you can see, the yellow trend line here going up in the kind of October period it's sort of coming back down a little bit but it'll be interesting to see over the next few days whether that starts scaling up again because of these punctuations I think it's a is it a, some kind of rolling average it's a it's a poly so there is um uh yeah exactly how he works that out i'll probably have to ask him but uh but i'm sure th that that will start tipping upwards in response to these uh more recent losses there but yeah so steep steep gradient showing that the russians are not having a good time with tank losses at the moment when it comes to apvs armored personnel vehicles that will include ip ifv so infantry fighting vehicles mine resistant ambush protection vehicles and armored personnel carriers very steep at the beginning of the war where they lost an awful lot uh then again the counter offenses that i've talked about in october november 2022 and then when you get to the uh, the russian uh, well, the end of the Ukrainian counteroffensive and the beginning of this Russian attacking phase where you had one day of 120 losses, which was absolutely phenomenal. Again, th these are the Avdivka losses predominantly, but then that went on to be, you know, at the moment, places like Sinkivka, 
um, Nova Makalivka, all these other places, Krinky as well on the Dnipro River. You can see that it's slightly uh, steeper here, and that's that's represents the, the fact that you know there have been some heavy losses uh, for the Russians in this time period. So again, the Russians lose more when they attack. So if you're the Ukrainians, you'd be like calculating, well, really, not only can we reconstitute in defence and possibly rotate, uh, you know, uh, generate troops through recruitment and get some more kit in from abroad and all these kind of things. But if we can then, if, if the Russians are going to commit Harry Kiri, um, then we can attrit them while sitting back and doing all the things we want to do. So defence is actually really useful for the Ukrainians, uh, these, these defensive periods. Especially when you look at the offensive periods where they really struggled, and that was down to you know, minefields, fortifications, uh, drones, and Russian uh, huge amounts of Russian troops just sitting in, and, and all of the about oh, and of course aviation, so the VKS and the FAB five hundred bombs. So that meant that you know we we saw a period of not a lot of Russian losses, and it was waiting till till the Russians went on the attack themselves before it kind of tipped up again. Artillery is an interesting one, and I talked about this. A little bit this morning how we had again some spikes where they lost a lot during the Kharkiv and Kherson counter offensives uh, and then what happened so this this is a different um this is a different narrative and this is why I like looking at data like this because it all these graphs tell you a story and the story was that during the Ukrainian counter offensive where they lost a bunch of stuff at Malatok Machka they then stopped attacking and they did predominantly infantry assaults which mean you didn't see an awful lot of uh, mechanized equipment for the Russians get destroyed it's more infantry on infantry and they're taking trench lines and tree lines right and that was what's going on so not a lot of equipment lost until the Russians went on the attack however what they did do and I talked about this endlessly during the counter offensive is that on a daily basis they said right we are getting hammered by artillery and we're being slowed down by minefields and fortifications and as we're slowed down we're then hammered by artillery so we need to do something about the artillery about the a aviation uh, and about the minefields so we're not going to attack in that same way Malatok Machka taught us this said the Ukrainians we're going to we're going to stop throwing Leopard 2 tanks and Bradleys at the problem we're going to send in sappers on the ground we're going to try and demine and we're going to send in infantry to clear out tree lines but that's really expensive in terms of human losses but while we are doing that we are going to work really bloody hard to degrade the Russian artillery and what what you've seen subsequently is counter battery fire being really effective the use of ukrainian drones uh, particularly then was asymmetrical uh, to, compared to the russians and they had an, a drone advantage it, it seems so counter battery drone advantage and then using high mars and gimlers as well as excalibur and all sorts of counter battery fire to to take out the individual pieces of kit has been something that's been ongoing and i showed you today again book a book launcher being taken out by high miles or similar so this is definitely what has been going on so what you what you see is that the Ukrainians had suffered at Malatok Machka. It all went a bit wrong there they scaled back their combined maneuvers but then went right we are now going to hammer the Russian artillery. And this steep line here is what's been happening ever since then and until relatively recently where we've seen it dip down. And you can see that from this yellow dotted line that trends downwards there. If I keep my uh, cursor on it, it turns to a black line. Sorry, it flicks as I move my cursor. But that trend line has gone right down. And even though there are some still some heavy losses for the, for the Russians, is not compared to what it previously was. So uh, this is where I was talking about how I think the the Russians have we have reached possibly a tipping point where the Russians are, are firing 10,000 artillery shells a day compared to the Ukrainian 2,000 which is a 5 to 1 ratio however 10,000 is not the 40 to 60,000 they were firing all the way back here which means that the Russians are struggling to fire uh, fire artillery uh, two reasons for that possible one is they don't have the shells two they don't have the artillery pieces or a combination of both of those and i would say it's a combination of both they're having to get shells in from north korea they have fewer shells than they definitely used to um uh, in terms of being able to produce them or procure them 
And the Ukrainians have absolutely hammered the crap out of the Russian artillery, such that this this period from uh, May through to well through to now, but p- particularly through to sort of November, uh, had caused the the Russians to lose you know sometimes fifty in this case fifty eight artillery pieces in the day. Okay, some of that damage can be refi- can be fixed and brought back to 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 life to fire again. But you get the point. There's going to be a massive attrition of Russian or there was a massive attrition of Russian artillery here and that now translates into one fewer bits of pieces of artillery to be targeted so you just have fewer artillery pieces and two uh, causes the Russians to be unable to fire as many artillery pieces at, at the Ukrainians then there are these complaints that there are no counter battery fire the Russians are claiming that in the Dnipro river area so on and so forth so that is the the story that I think this graph tells us really useful thanks to Dale for for just bringing this to our attention i think it's so useful even if you scale these all back by 30 percent, do that across the board we found out from the analysis around abdivka that the up and down of the general staff figures uh, correlates exactly to the up and down of actually what happens with visually visually confirmed losses so whatever you say about the general staff figures they are consistent e- either they are consistent on point totally accurate or they're consistently inflating the figures by the same kind of amount in other words if you take 20 percent off or 30 percent off these graphs will still tell you the same story you're just scaling it back in terms of the actual real numbers does that make sense so so these are still super useful even if you have uh, a, a propaganda inflation or an inaccuracy inflation or whatever uh, and that's why it's really cool to go through these graphs in the way hopefully that you know in this way hopefully so so you get that value too right In terms of multiple launch rocket systems, the problem is it's all a bit jaggedy. Why is it jaggedy? Because when you don't have as much data, it's easy to have anomalies. Uh, So on a day where you say lose six pieces or or 10 pieces, you know, equal highest, that spikes massively and it might throw your averages you know in into interesting ways or, or have little spikes of, of steep gradients but it doesn't last very long and so you just get very jagged uh, totals here because it, there just aren't enough of these being destroyed on a daily basis to build up a, a huge picture um, you can see that they lost a lot near the beginning relatively speaking and there are these periods of you know denser losses more consistent daily losses but again it's really uh, you know this is the, the picture that the only real story that you can get from this is that since the Malatok Machka situation where they sat back and said, we need to hit the, Ru- the Russian artillery, they've lost more consistently. So the Russians, the, so MLRS fits in line, generally speaking, I would argue, with the picture of artillery losses. Uh, and that's exactly what I'd expect. Uh, and I would expect the same to be true of anti aircraft. So again, we've got, you know, fairly consistent, but easy to have anomalies, uh, fairly consistent losses for air defense systems because they aren't they only lose on average about one and a half a day uh, but then when you start getting to the counter offensive that's when the ukrainians realized they had to take out air defense systems to try and rest back air advantage at least or something like that to to, to give their helicopters a chance uh, and yeah and to give their drones a chance etc etc so you saw this concerted effort with a couple of spikes of nine and eight being lost in in a single day at times during the counter offensive and we've seen that fairly consistently uh, take place since then a little spike recently uh, but it did go down and I think again, you're going. To, it's going to be the same situation as with artillery, whereby they're going to start running out of targets for for their their drones or counter battery fire or whatever or, or gimlets. So I think the Russians have lost a lot of air defense systems, and they've probably got to a bit of a tipping point. Although there has been a spike in the last few days or few weeks, really. Uh, but again, it's it's somewhat easy to get spikes like that when it doesn't take that many losses. To, to do that i mean you're talking about two or three a day but you know fairly consistently recently so it's good news for the ukrainians but hopefully that, that makes sense of that graph uh, and then we have aircraft where they really steep at the beginning so right at the beginning why is that uh, that's because they were using more aircraft and what happened is they they invaded ukraine and the ukrainians they didn't do sead or sead they did seed suppression of enemy air defenses or destruction of enemy air defenses for long enough normally you do like three months of that absolutely bombard the crap out of ukraine and then you would move in with your aircraft because you you have control of the skies you've destroyed their air defense system 
systems. They didn't do that. They did a couple of days of that and then went, right, let's do it because there's going to be no retaliation from the Ukrainians. There's only a special military operation. We're going to go in and we'll, we'll have control of the air. Uh, it didn't happen. And they're like, so then they were flying loads of sorties and they were getting hit by the air defense systems that they hadn't taken out. They hadn't done a good enough job on taking them out. And so they lost loads of planes. If you remember, you, there was so much footage of Stinger's, uh, Stinger man pads and similar taking out air, uh, jets, you know, all over the front line. And what happened is, is then about May uh, time, they just stopped using the um, their VKS as riskily as they were, and they became far more cautious. Uh, uh, and indeed, after that, they eventually developed the glide kits for, for the FAB KAB bombs, so they didn't even need to get near the front line. And that's kind of what you see in this period here, is they don't need to get near the front line. So what we're going to do is we're just going to... Um, uh, we're going to fly 70 kilometers back and drop these bombs now a couple of spikes this spike here let's see is that may yeah so that's going to be the bryansk day where they lost f uh well it says three there but there was five in one day actually those ones weren't included in general staff figures if i remember correctly so there should be a bigger spike here uh the ones lost inside russia that now is accepted to have been a patriot system placed in the north of ukraine so interesting about that but anyway more recently we are seeing more consistent losses i know it's it, it's difficult to build up hugely interesting pictures because again the, there's not enough raw data there's just not enough planes lost uh, to give you to give you really robust conclusions but i will say that that it looks like ukrainian air defenses are improving more recently given some of these losses that we have seen so they're starting to pick up in terms of taking out the russian um aircraft here where we had three lost in a day that that was the three lost in the Kherson blast due to the patriot uh, as is claimed and then a couple the next day uh but but yeah that's the russian aircraft so it's a bit a bit jaggedy here and there and really i think you could say the same about helicopters where you got you know quite a lot lost on that day is that going to be as a result of the um the hit on Berdyansk airfield i don't know uh but they've had some bad days here and there but as you can see i i guess the possibly the the most important thing to note here is hardly any losses uh, in the last, what, six months. And I think that probably suggests that the, the Russians just aren't using the helicopters like they used to. Why not? Because the Ukrainians are able to shoot them down more. We saw them during the counteroffensive use a bunch uh, and, and use them to support the the defense of the Zaporizhia particularly and as a result they lost the number fairly consistently but they were being used quite effectively but with that effective use comes a risk and that counteroffensive saw the Russians lose a lot of helicopters and then at the end of the counteroffensive when the Ukrainians kind of pulled back a little bit and uh, sort of weren't attacking so so much and it looks like the Russians were also using their helicopters less uh, and then I uh, this is possibly them getting hit in Berdyansk and Luhansk. Um, but there are different claims as to how many were lost. And I don't know what the general staff do with those kind of figures. Because as I said, they didn't include the ones lost in Bryansk uh, from the Patriot missile. So uh, anyway, there you go. These are UAVs. And it appears these are, these are to me, it appears that these are Shahid drones as opposed to any other larger drones. And you can see that there are certain spikes and that would probably be deliveries of those from Iran. But they, they might be producing their own now, certainly uh, still getting them delivered. But yeah, you can see that uh, recently spiked right upwards and that is December. So they've really ramped up the use of both Shahids and as we've seen cruise missiles and, and ballistic missiles as well. So that is... Uh, that's that's the 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 recent picture which you should see yep cruise missiles suddenly spiking up again uh, as we had that big attack the other day uh, so starting to use them a bit more in uh, december compared to that that period of two to three months where they really didn't use any uh, or hardly any at all so certainly that those two months there um the question the question was whether they were stockpiling them or unable to produce them or or kind of both and then the, what i asked this morning is okay we've got the biggest drone uh use uh 
to date um, 90, although there, there is a day of 93 here. So I, I don't know what that's about, whether that, that includes some of the other sh other drones other than Shahid's. But we learned that, that or, ah, uh, no, I think also, yes, last night's one won't appear on these because there's usually a day lag. So supposedly last night was the biggest drone wave attack but the question is well why weren't the cruise missiles sent along with them and the only thing that makes sense to me is they just don't have them because they would have done that because that's what they've done previously and that's the use of the shahids is that they exhaust air defense stockpiles you know air defense magazines of uh, missiles so that then the cruise missiles can get through well if you aren't sending the cruise missiles then it's a bit of a waste of those shahis to some degree uh, and in fact if 87 out of the 90 was shot down then that is that is arguably a massive waste of shahis if you're not going to send the missiles afterwards so why didn't you send the missiles afterwards because you didn't have them that's the only thing that makes sense to me really Otherwise, that if you were keeping those missiles for for some other thing later, then you keep those drones for that thing as well, because those ninety drones are super useful for clearing the way for the missiles. Anyway, uh, as far as warships and boats, we've seen recently uh, it's been problematic for the for the Russians in the Black Sea, but I don't know that you can make too much of of this data set because again it's it's too infrequent that that they are they are taken out um vehicles and fuel tanks i think is interesting to look at because we can see yet again since the ukrainian counteroffensive started this general uh, incline of the trend line to suggest that they've been working really hard to take out logistics and even since the ukrainians have stopped their counteroffensive they are still hammering away at russian logistics it, which makes you again if you go back to the artillery and say well why is artillery really decreased and yet vehicles and fuel tanks have carried on kind of increasing in, in, in by looking at the trend and you know you've got a much steeper line there the only thing that makes sense of that is they just don't have the artillery because the ukrainians are still clearly using first person view drones and other drones to do this and to spot for artillery or whatever but actually with things like vehicles and fuel tanks these are moving targets are almost certainly going to be fpv drones uh, and uh, previously those have been also really effective against artillery because artillery has been closer to the front line than ideal because that they're supposedly the russian artillery doesn't have the range it should because of barrel wear etc etc so if they're still hitting vehicles and fuel tanks well they're continuing to in increase that the level at which they're hitting those logistics and yet they're not doing that to artillery again it suggests to me uh, that the russians don't have the artillery so again, the, all of these, I think, give such a, a rich understanding of, of the narrative of this war and what's going on on the front line. I really appreciate what Dell has done in, in putting this together, as I say every time I go through these. And hopefully that gives you an understanding of where we are. And I think to go back to what I've said many times before, the Ukrainians are in a much better position than they were a year ago. And the much better position they're in is add up all of this. Add up all of this stuff that has happened in the last year. It's phenomenal. I mean, even with, you know, with those warships as well. But you know, heli uh, helicopters, aircraft, anti-aircraft. You know, all of this, all of this, the Russians do not have anymore. Uh, MLRS, they don't have those systems anymore, or they're damaged, or or whatever. Uh, artillery. I mean, look at that in terms of artillery. So the the Ukrainians are just in a much better position. I mean, this is my favorite graph because that is a steep line and that is a, just a massive amount of metal that has been destroyed. Uh, APV is useful as well. I mean, goodness me, it's been some, some incredibly uh, suicidal activity by the the russian units in terms of losing tanks uh, and apvs over the last three months so anyway let me know what you think about this data is this a useful analysis uh, i think personally i think it is i think it, is, it gives us a sense of what is going on uh, please check out this data on a regular basis and um yeah, thank you so much for watching. I'm going to put myself back in in front of of where well back where I normally am because otherwise people might might you know, people don't like change. Anyway, take care. Toodle pips.